So many women I coach really, their default belief is like, I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing it wrong or I'm doing it all wrong. But is this even the thing you want to be doing? Like you're capable of being successful at this, but is this the thing? And because women are socialized to not see themselves as like authorities, we defer. Well, and there's so many versions of this, right? There's the woman that just doesn't even try because she's thinking I have to stay at home, right? Or my husband yep. wants me to stay at home. Maybe they feel a little guilty or they're not really sure. Yeah. You don't need to be 100% bought in, but you just need to have a little bit in you just to take that first step. Yeah, I had no entrepreneurial experience. The reason that women struggle with finding alignment often is that what we're socialized to do is try to like all right today we're going to talk about winning in business and not feeling bad about it not feeling guilty about maybe being the female breadwinner in your family, whatever that looks like. I am so excited to be interviewing Kara Lowenthal. She is the new author of Take Back Your Brain. So I'm super excited. So Kara has been somebody I've actually listened to and watched for many, many years. Uh, she is in the life coach world and she is just gonna talk about what it looks like to catch some of these thoughts, these ideas going on in your head and how that's holding you back, how that's, you know, not even allowing you to do the next big thing because you're scared, you're nervous, you're anxious. What are people going to think? What is my spouse going to think? What are my high school friends going to think? What are my peers going to think? My colleagues going to think, right? How do we really start to look at what do I want? Maybe even looking at, am I setting, like, are those my goals? Did I set them because everybody else wants that? And I brought up in there how, you know, I always wanted to be a seven figure entrepreneur until everybody was talking about eight. <laughs> and then I'm like, I don't want seven figures. I want to, I want to be 10 million in annual revenue. Well, why do I want that? Cause everybody else wants that. Right. We fall into the trap of like, we just want the next big thing. Right. The question is, why do I want that? What do I think it's going to say about me? Or what is it, what, what is it going to mean when I hit those numbers? And, and so many of us, right. We're just shooting for the next revenue level. And when you get there, what does it change? How does it feel, right? Like sometimes you're wondering, why am I even shooting for this? What, what am I even doing? What does this look like? So I'm really excited to introduce you to Kara. Take Back Your Brain is her book. Uh, you are gonna love her. This is a great conversation and it might start to describe what's been going on and why maybe you've been holding yourself back or why you're doing things the way you're doing it or the, the things that are going on in your head. So um, just I'm excited to introduce you to Kara and, and have you get to start to really understand what's been happening maybe for the last few years or decades as you've been growing your business. Enjoy. Hi, Kara. Welcome to Well Oiled. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat. I love mindset. I love I love all of this. So I'm I'm really excited to kind of dive in. I think it's so incredibly important. We are so brainwashed to just learn skill sets and what's next. And we don't sometimes consider what our brain is telling us. So I'm excited to have you here. Before we dive in to your new book, congrats on hitting New York Times bestseller. That's huge. Uh, before we dive in, I would love to have you just kind of share how did you get into entrepreneurship? What did your journey look like? So I say I had the the classic history of going to Harvard to become a lawyer, going to Harvard Law School, becoming a litigator. And then I was a reproductive rights litigator. And then I was became an academic. So I was on the path to become a law professor. And then as one does, I quit that completely, closed the chapter on my entire legal career and became a life coach on the internet instead. And those are, that's how I ended up here. Um, but I mean, really what happened is that, that is really what happened. But um, I, the reason I made that seemingly at the time deranged choice that paid off is um, that I had like many kind of ambitious, high achieving women, I was driven by a lot of um, insecurity and anxiety. And I thought those were like, what was propelling me. Like I thought sort of that I was successful because I was anxious and because I was hard on myself and because I ground it out, grinded it out. I I do speak English. I'm just back from my honeymoon. My brain's not totally working. Um, and then I found coaching and the mindset work I do. And I started to see how I was wrong about some of that, like how my sort of um, belief that's like being miserable and feeling sh bad about myself <laughs> was propelling me, was actually not, was actually holding me back. Mm -hmm. And once I learned how to change the way that I thought, um, it it just became so clear to me that like, this was um, the biggest growth edge for me, the biggest contribution I could make. You know, I, I was 
very successful in my former career. And I think you'd assume I must have been good at it. And I think I was good at it, but I don't think it was like my true zone of genius because I wasn't truly deeply interested in it, but it was like the traditional mainstream career path. Um, and so once I found coaching, I kind of couldn't go back. It was a little bit of a like watershed moment. And now I run the School of New Feminist Thought, which is my business. I'm the creator of the Feminist Self-Help Society, which is my coaching program. I have a seven, multiple seven-figure business. And then I host a podcast on F Your Brain and had my first book come out a few months ago. So a book is no joke. And then for you to play full out and hit New York Times, like I can only imagine the work involved. Um, what made you decide now is the time for this book? Uh, it is not a joke. And if you are... <laughs> Like it's a whole job. So I would like am running a company, a multiple seven figure company, and I have a team, and that's a job by itself. And then, of course, my book ended up being coming out like right around the time that a lot of people have experienced a lot of market fluctuation, and it's been a challenging economic climate the last two years. So it's been a real, it's been a real journey. Um, I so I think that um I wanted to wait. I sort of have always wanted to write a book about my work, but I wanted to wait and I did wait until I felt like I really had something new and different to say. I think like as a former self-help junkie, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate, like you read a lot of self-help or self-development or business books or whatever, and you're like, this could have been a blog post. In fact, this probably was a blog post and now somebody turned it into a book, right? Like I could have, this was, I needed five pages on this, not 250. So I did not want to write a book like that. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that I had my full um, kind of worldview and perspective like figured out. I really was integrating my entire previous professional background of feminist theory and social structures with all of this mindset and cognitive change work. So I didn't want to like write it kind of, oh, the first time the podcast went viral. Now I can get a book deal. Like I really wanted to have a full amount. And I honestly, now looking back, I'm like, oh, that could have been like 10 books. Like each of those chapters has as much as some people would put in a whole book, but having done it once, I don't know if I'm doing it again. So it's probably good. I got it all. Okay. Is that really what happened? The podcast went viral and then you got <clears throat> to do a book deal? No, I mean, I think like that would be the first time I could have. It's sort yeah, of like I a guess. podcast took off and that would have been, that was 2017, but I didn't want to have that like, okay, yeah. well now this is the first time people are listening. So now I'm gonna write my book. Like I really spent another six years Dying. doing the work, getting case studies, you know, honing my method, really articulating it and creating something really new. Yeah, I love it. So your book is called Take Back Your Brain, How a Sexist Society Gets in Your Head and How to Get It Out. So I just want to make sure everybody's got that whole sub headline here too as well. <laughs> so we're going to dive into a lot of that. Um, I would love for you to share, like, what do you see? I know you talk about this brain gap. What is it? How do we overcome it? What does that look like? So the brain gap is, there's sort of two brain gaps. The first one is the gap between how men and women are socialized, meaning what are the kind of implicit and explicit messages we get from society? So that might look like your grandma, you know, comments on what you're wearing, but not on what your brother's wearing, right? Or there's like a different dress code in your school, like for girls and boys. Or it might be when you watch a movie and you're eight, what is the gender of the person who's the CEO of the company? And what is the gender of the person who's the secretary? And like, who is the stay-at-home parent in the sitcoms? And right, so all of these things. So I personally grew up in a family that was, um, you know, my mother and even my grandmother were very highly educated. I'm a third generation women lawyer, which there aren't that many of us. So I personally grew up in a family that was very focused on women having careers, having an education. Like I was not being told like, just get your MRS before you leave Yale. That's why you're going. But that was just one part of my life. I still was exposed to the entire culture, right? And you still hear like, how do people talk about male business leaders versus female business leaders? How many men do you know who have businesses versus women you know who have businesses, right? How is it treated? Like I remember in, was in my 20s even when like the CEO of Yahoo was a woman and she was like praised for being on her BlackBerry two hours after she gave birth, right? Like what are the expectations for women? So all of that stuff gets absorbed, especially when you are a child, it's just all going into your brain. Your brain is like a sponge soaking up everything. And it's putting it all together. Like what, what are men and women valued for? What's different about them? So you are growing up with all these messages. And what women hear is that their value comes from being nice, being kind, being helpful, making sure you never hurt anyone's feelings, being attractive in a certain very specific way, 
right? Being like, and a lot of it is very contradictory. Like you mm -hmm. need to really care about what you look like, but don't be frivolous, shallow, or vain. You, but if you don't care about what you look like, then you let yourself go, right? You should be independent and don't be a gold digger. But if you make too much money, then like, and you're straight, then your husband will feel emasculated. So don't do that. So there are all these like really contradictory messages. And then they create the kind of second version of the brain gap, which is the gap that a lot of people socialized as women experience in your own brain between what you want to think and feel and how you actually think and feel, right? And so in business, for instance, that might look like you intellectually believe that women can be amazing leaders and CEOs and good at business and good at making money and all of these things. And you are constantly worried that you're being irresponsible or making the wrong decision. Or, you know, if you do take a risk and it doesn't pay off, then you're beating yourself up and telling yourself you should have done it differently. And so, and this can happen at any level, right? Like you can be paralyzed by anxiety in your life and this is happening, or you can be a CEO of a multinational corporation and this can be happening in your brain. We're just experiencing it at our different levels. So I think people would have been surprised to have met if you'd met me, really at no point in my life would you have been like, oh, what an anxious wallflower who can't, you know, yeah. is like incapacitated by her anxiety. Like you never would have thought that. Mm -hmm. But in my head, it was just this constant, like, you know, so many women I coach, really high powered, successful women, lots of entrepreneurs, you're, their default belief is like, I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing it wrong. Or I'm doing it all wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's so many versions of this, right? There's the woman that just doesn't even try because she's thinking I have to stay at home, right? Or my husband yep. wants me to stay at home and she's doing it. There's the women who are crushing it, but maybe we feel guilty or what do we say? Or um, somebody once asked me a few years ago, like, are you the breadwinner? And it was on a public podcast. And I even felt guilty saying, mm. uh, do I announce that I'm the breadwinner? Like now it's right. obvious he's, he's working with me. So it's very obvious, but I, I didn't know if that was like disrespectful to say or right. right? Like you're, we just, we've grown up very differently. And, and I did grow up in an entrepreneurial family where like the women worked with the spouses, but mom and grandma were mostly taking care of us mm -hmm. while the dads and the grandpas, right. were working. So yeah. I did see a different, a different version of that for sure. So let's talk to the person that is doing it and doing it anyway, but maybe they feel a little guilty or they're not really sure. And they don't want to, you know, have problems with their, their relationship with their spouse. What do you say to that person? How do we start to break these norms? You may be crushing it, but do you like the thing you're crushing it in? And do you like the way that you're crushing it? Like I was quote unquote, crushing it as, you know, in my previous career, like I graduated from Harvard Law School with honors. I clerked on a federal appeals court and I had, you know, I becoming a law professor. Is very, like I was doing all these things and I was actually good at them, but I didn't actually love them. And I don't think that I had as good ideas there as I do in business. It's like, so I think this often comes up, especially with them who have been successful. It's like, but is this even the thing you want to be doing? Like you're capable of being successful at this, but is this the thing or, and, or is it how you want to be doing it? Like maybe you're doing it the way that you're you were taught to, your mentor in business did, or your first boss did, or your business coach tells you to, or whatever. And because women are socialized to not see themselves as like authorities, we defer, like, especially to men, but also to other women, like anybody who can be the authority and tell us the right way to do it. So that's the thing I see come up a lot with um, entrepreneurial women who are even succeeding in their business is like, still, there's a lot of background chatter of like, am I doing it right? Like having a hard time sometimes making decisions or making pivots or taking risks in terms of being the breadwinner or a mask. I mean, I think you can't control somebody else's feelings, obviously. And I think that it's a like society and patriarchy are bad for men too. And they, right, they can find people into certain roles based on their perceived gender that may or may not fit them. And in our family, like I'm the primary earner. I'm the only earner. My partner was worked in government and then was retired around the time that I met him. And like, it's a much better fit for our temperaments that I work and that he, we have, I have stepkids, they're his bio kids. So like, he's the primary caregiver for them. He's like the person who likes to like, I don't know, do things around the house and like fix things and do the dishes that, you know, he's someone who likes to express his love and nurture yeah. through those kinds of servicey tasks that I'm not. And so I think, a, I mean, I think a like, what's the right word? A misconception about feminism is that it's like, you know, that there's sort of, well, you know, housework's not worthy or caregiving isn't worthy or parenting. And it's like, the the goal is just let's everybody be allowed to pick the role they want, mm -hmm. regardless of their gender. And yeah. so, you know, some men probably would feel emasculated by our arrangement and they're not the right partner for me. Yeah, absolutely. When you decided to leave law, like for 
life coaching. I assume in the beginning, well, I shouldn't assume anything, but in the beginning, what was your mindset saying? Were you scared? Were you nervous? Were you like, I don't care. We're doing this. Like, what was your attitude at that time? And I just had like just enough belief to do it. Okay. I mean, I was not yeah. like completely fine. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember telling, I told my, I decided I would tell my parents at a family party because I figured like if it was done sort of in public, nobody could freak out. Um, How did but that was go? really about me. And like, you know, <laughs> I wasn't prepared to stand or freak out. And then, you know, I would like tell all these law professors I was leaving and like watch their faces be like, they couldn't like control their faces mm -hmm. um so I didn't know I didn't feel I would tell everybody it was true I originally decided I was going to coach lawyers because that seemed like it sort of made sense given what yeah. I've been doing it didn't seem like as completely bananas as mm -hmm. just you know going all the way so no and I think that's a big misconception especially I find women have is because we're socialized to like be so afraid of making the wrong decision and women are socialized to blame themselves if anything ever goes wrong and women just get blamed in society, if anything, right? I mean, just think about, you know, the discourse around like, was she asking for it? What was she wearing? I mean, anything that happens. So we're so socialized to blame if anything goes wrong. So we're afraid to, and we're socialized to not trust ourselves. So we're afraid to take risks. And again, it's all relative. Some, you know, I took, I've taken enough risks to have a seven figure business and I can still see that there are places that I'm like yeah. afraid to take a risk. Cause what if that, you know, goes wrong? Um, so I think women think like, okay, when I'm perfectly confident, that's when I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And you obviously can spend your whole life not doing anything if you're waiting to be perfectly confident. So I, you know, I think I was somewhat lucky in that I had this kind of inflection point of like, if I don't do this now, that means I'm going to go on the market, get a job as a law professor, like move to Kansas, teach torts, and then quit and become a life coach. Like I got to do it now. But no, I think it was like, you just need that like 1%. And then- yeah. Yeah. I love the way you phrase that, like just enough belief to do it, right? Like yeah. you don't need to be a hundred percent bought in, but you just need to have a little bit in you to just to take that first step. Yeah. I had no entrepreneurial experience. I mean, but this is also such a funny thing about our mindsets is like at the time I thought everybody should think this was a great idea. Right. And then looking back, I'm like, why would anyone have thought this was a good <laughs> idea? Like I had spent all of this time and money and effort on like this career path that was about yeah. to take off. I had no entrepreneurial experience. I was quitting to become a life coach on the internet, but that was because I didn't have full belief in myself. So I wanted everybody else to believe in me mm. to validate it. Mm -hmm. Right. Even though yeah. like it was objectively a very surprising thing to be doing. So not yeah. surprising. How do we, you know, you made the shift. You feel like you're in alignment now. How can we make sure that we feel in alignment, like as people are listening, I'm sure this is sparking some ideas and some thoughts and all of that, but what are some things that you could share to really help somebody yeah. figure that out? I'm a big proponent in women um, deciding what their values are quite literally. And in an area of your life, you don't have to have like, some people have like the three values in all areas of their lives. I have my own, I have certain values in my business, certain values in my personal life. Literally, you can Google a list of values, like go through and circle 20 and then 10 and break, take it down. But the reason that women struggle with finding alignment often is that what we're socialized to do is try to like geolocate all of our decisions based on the opinions of everybody around us and what they're all going to think about us. And that is a very exhausting way to operate and not very effective. And also you're worrying about like what your third grade bully thought, who's maybe dead. You don't even know them anymore. Like you're sort of constantly trying to make decisions based on how can I be sure this is exactly the right decision that nothing bad will happen? And what is everybody I have ever known going to think about me in this decision? Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of what happens is people are like, oh, just try to stop caring what other people think. That's a vacuum. You can't do that. You have to be, you have to use some other technique or set of tools for deciding things. And because most women have, have been socialized that like what other people think matters more than what they think, yeah. they're not necessarily in touch with what their own values really are. They haven't articulated them to themselves. So, that is what I really recommend is like, go get a list of values. You don't have to, you don't have to marry these values. Just try running your business for a week with the three values you've come up with. And like, you'll see how much that helps you see, oh, this decision would be, would match these values. This decision wouldn't like, it's going to help you hone in and have a like vocabulary to talk about why you're making certain decisions. And it gives you a framework, especially in the beginning when you're not really ready to just like trust your decision just because you made it, it gives you like a way of thinking through it. Yeah. 
We care so much about what others think. We Sometimes we can't even remember like, wait, why did I set that goal? Where did that goal come from? A yeah. lot of our goals is because somebody else said it. We're like, oh, I should want that too. Or, oh, is that yep. what we're shooting for now? And okay, seven figures isn't good enough anymore. You have to be an eight figure entrepreneur. So we all won 10 million. And it's like, right. it's just crazy because somebody else said it yeah. and then we go there. So can we talk a little bit about feeling the emotions feeling the tough emotions sometimes, you know, we want big numbers. We want to scale. We want to outgrow. And sometimes maybe we're not, or why do we even want that? Like, how do we start to really feel our feelings and, and be okay with it? I mean, I think that question of why do you want it is what matters, right? Because most of the time we're like, I'll just feel good enough about myself once I get there, right? So I have a, I have a friend and a colleague who, um, it took her a while to make her first seven figures. And she had like a lot of suffering about that, that, you know, I or others had made seven figures for it. And she finally made her first seven figures and then she cried for like two weeks straight because mm -hmm. it wasn't the magic land, yeah. right? It wasn't the promised land. That's in the, my book. I actually write about this in the context of romantic relationships, but it's true in business too, of like magical thinking. Like when I get there, it will be paradise. So when you imagine if you're making seven figures and you imagine your eight figure self, you never imagine your eight figure self like worried about money or feeling lonely or sad. You only imagine your eight figure self just feeling like, abundant and amazing and confident all the time. But the destination always feels like the journey is going to, right? So if you are like beating yourself up for not being at eight figures, or if you are kind of exacerbating lack in your mind around not being at eight figures, you're going to get to eight figures and you're going to start looking at the people at nine figures and then you're going to be feeling the same way. So for me, it's almost like before we even get to how can we deal with the hard emotions, it's like, well, what is that emotion coming from? Because you told yourself that you'd be a real business owner if you got to seven figures. And since you're not, what you're saying to yourself is, I'm a shitty business owner. Like, yeah, I could teach you how to tolerate that that sadness, but also you're creating it for yourself with a totally unnecessary thought. So maybe let's just change that thought. Yeah, so good. So you talk about these three R's of emotions, resist, react, receive. I would love to dive in and, and just take a minute there. So these are kind of your three options. <laughs> so resist is what a lot of us are familiar with, which is you just pretend it's not happening mm -hmm. and you just try to ignore it. Yep. I have never been good at this one. My partner is a world-class. I mean, now I've gotten to him and now he's learned that his feelings are useful information. But when I met him, he just was so good at compartmentalizing that he could just be kind of like, oh, I've just decided to say, like not have that feeling for 20 years. So I've never been able to do that, but many of us are good at it. So that is when you were like, I'm just going to ignore this feeling. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to get on social media or I'm going to buy something on the online or I'm going to watch Netflix or I'm going to eat or drink or I'm going to just work through, probably have a lot of workaholics listening to this. Like I'm just gonna right to, I'm gonna try to outrun my emotion by doing something to keep it at bay. That's resisting. That really doesn't work long term. First of all, your body's still having the emotion, even if you don't know. So as a parallel example, when I met my partner, he was like having, he had all he had like heartburn. He didn't really know he was having. Like if you shut off from your emotions, you're shutting off from your body and your body is going to keep doing its thing. So you're still having all those stress hormones. You're still creating all that inflammation. Eventually your emotions are going to bubble up to the surface. So it doesn't really work long-term, but listen, it's a coping strategy. There's no shame in any of these. Like we weren't taught how to deal with our feelings. Okay. Reacting to your feelings is more when you're aware that you feel something bad and you are like, how can I make this go away as soon as possible? So this is actually more where you see like, yeah, you know, Netflix, eating, drinking, blah, 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 but also just taking a lot of impulsive action. So like, I will see entrepreneurs do this, like you are having anxiety about money. And so you're just like, okay, I'm just gonna create this whole new program. And then I'm just gonna go sell this thing. And I'm gonna, right. So it's like, I'm gonna take a bunch of action totally. yep. or like, I'm anxious. So I'm gonna send a crazy text. Like that's that sort of impulsive impulsivity. And that like, can be where like the shiny object comes from. Totally. Like, it's not just that you see an op and like an option. You're like, I need that option because this isn't going well. So maybe this is the shiny thing that's yes. going to make it. Any kind of urgency is a sign yeah. that you are like in that reaction. Mm -hmm. And then receiving is what I call, that's what some people would call like feeling your feelings, but I never knew what that meant. And to me, I like the word receiving because it's sort of like the posture of receiving is the sort of like leaning back and opening your arms. Like it sort of helps me in a somatic way body way to be like okay what does receiving mean so it's like this thing can land you know like I will hold it like I am willing to allow this emotion to be here so much of our distress around our emotions is not the emotion itself so if you feel anxious and it's at a nine I can almost guarantee you that the actual anxiety is like four at most 
on a scale from one to 10. And from four to nine, what you're feeling is the distress you create in your mind and body when you tell yourself, oh my God, I got to get rid of this feeling. Like, I don't want to have this. It's bad. When you tell yourself that you're not, when you're not willing to have a feeling, you're telling your brain there's something dangerous happening in our body right now. And then your brain really freaks out because now the bad thing is inside the body and it can't get away from it. So that resistance in a really literal way, like ramps up your brain's alarm system. Yeah. So receiving doesn't mean like, oh, I feel amazing all the time. Yeah. Like negative emotions are part of life. But if you're feeling like a lot of our suffering is really our story about and reaction to our emotion. Maybe five years ago, I would lose my voice all the time. I mm. wasn't sick. It would just like go away out of nowhere. And it was 1000% coming from stress and other uh -oh. things behind the scenes. And like you said, whether you're going to feel it or not, your body's going through yeah. it. And I definitely can tell you, I mean, it was, and it was probably in the start of this second business where I was still like figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Um, and it hasn't happened in a long, long time, but my stress level is definitely different. So yeah. it's interesting. I used to get an eye twitch. Oh, how funny. Yeah. It's just like your body is still trying to speak to yeah, you 1000%. Totally. So how do we, how do we get better at this strategy? How do we start to feel, feel them more and not resist or react? Like what, what can we do to be more conscious of that? I mean, I'm honestly a big fan of literally just saying to yourself, like, I'm willing to feel this feeling, or mm -hmm. I don't like this feeling, but it's okay for it to be here. Or, you know, just really signaling to yourself, like, okay, what's happening? I'm having an emotion. And I notice that I don't want it to be here and I'm trying to get away from it. And like just practicing bringing yourself back to like, what if it was okay that I was having this feeling? You know, sometimes um, it's useful to pick an, a physical sensation that doesn't bother you that much and kind of analogize it to that. Like, what if this feeling is just the same as, let's say, having a headache? So for me, I don't really care. I don't get headaches that often. I don't care about them that much. So they're not dramatic for me. So for me, that works. Somebody else has a lot of drama about their headaches. You might have to pick heartburn or something, but like, what's a, everybody's got like some physical sensation that they're like, eh, it's unpleasant, but like, it's fine. Mm -hmm. If you are a runner or something, you definitely like your experience with that. Anything you can analog analogize for your brain to just be like, okay, I don't love this thing. It doesn't feel great, but it is not like a threat. It is not dangerous. It's okay for it to be here and it's going to pass. Like, I honestly really recommend that people just practice the changing their reaction to the emotion before they really even get into trying to change the emotion. Because yeah. if you try to change it, like this happens sometimes, I think, especially with, I totally think nervous regulation and somatic tools are useful. But if you're using them because you're like, I can't have this feeling, I got to get rid of it. it. It's not any better. Like it's still, if your message to yourself is, this physical state is intolerable and I have to get rid of it or I'm going to die, then no tool is really going to work because you're agitating yourself as you try to calm down, basically. Yeah. Okay. So good. Cara, we could chat all day. This is so, so good. Can you tell everybody where can they find your book or more about you, your podcast, wherever you want to share? So you can buy my book anywhere you buy books and, or if you don't, you can just go to takebackyourbrainbook.com and you can click to buy the book wherever you buy books. Um, and my podcast is called on F the whole word, your brain, but if you just search my name, you'll find it. Um, and those are the best places to learn more from me right now. Amazing. Well, congrats on the success of the book, on the success of your business. It's Thank an you. important message, which is why it just, right. When it, when something blows up this fast, it's because there's a need and, and people are excited to hear a different message. So, um, we're grateful for you and your message and, um, definitely go check out Cara's book. Thank you.